Okay, we will understand some basic definitions. Can see the screen, the children? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Geometry is around us all the time. It's so intricately involved in our day to day life that we don't even notice it. How, you may ask? Imagine that we're walking in a straight line for one kilometer. After that, we turn left. Oh, voice is breaking. We turn left and walk in this direction. Now for the last time, we turn left and walk one kilometer. We would find that we are at the same place we started from. If we trace our route, we would find that we walked in a square-shaped route. Audible children? This was only one example. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Have you noticed the seeds in a sunflower? If you look closely, they form a spiral shaped design. Do you know any other examples where you notice a spiral pattern? I know one, spiral galaxies. These are types of galaxies that have a spiral pattern similar to our sunflower seeds. So we see that geometry is involved in things as small as sunflower seeds to things as big as galaxies. Don't you think it would be fun to study these geometrical shapes? We have a very long history with the knowledge of geometry. From ancient times, people were aware of geometry and used it in their day-to-day -day life. Let's take an example of ancient Egypt. Long ago, the people of ancient Egypt faced a problem every year. The problem was that the Nile River used to flood each year. And whenever it flooded, it used to destroy the boundaries of land near the banks of the river. This used to put the landowners in a problem. After the flood, the boundaries of lands would dissolve away. So nobody would know which part of the land belonged to who. And this would result in confusion. As this was an annual problem, they came up with a system of measuring land and redistributing it to the respective owners after the flood. This system of measuring was one of the factors that gave birth to the word geometry which we study today. The Indus Valley Civilization around the year 3000 BCE also made use of geometry. Their cities were well planned, houses had different types of rooms, well planned roads and a good drainage system. This was not possible if they did not know the use of geometry. Basically, geometry was being used in many parts of the world throughout the period. The word geometry itself comes from the combination of Greek words, geo meaning land or earth, and metri meaning measurement. So geometry means the measurement of earth. The geometry we study on paper today was actually conceived as a solution for day-to-day -day problems in the ancient world. The ancient Egyptians also used geometry in construction, designing granaries and making the pyramids. So, all the existing knowledge about geometry was brought together in a form of books by Euclid. Euclid was a Greek mathematician who used to teach mathematics in the city of Alexandria in Egypt. He was the first person to collect all the work done on geometry and put it together in books called Elements. His books contain definitions, axioms, postulates, and proofs that we can use to prove things further ahead in complex geometry. We will try to cover some important definitions, axioms, and postulates from his books that will help us in solving and proving theorems to make our understanding of geometry clearer. So in the next lesson, we will learn about some of the basic definitions in geometry that Euclid put in his book named Elements.
So today we are going to learn more about <coughs> introduction to Euclid's geometry children. This chapter five. Okay. So yes, have you all understood how this geometry is introduced to the world? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yes, ma Next video, I am going to show some definitions already which we have learned in our previous class and the okay. meaning of axioms and postulates and the proofs. Okay. Okay, ma'am. In this lesson, we will understand some basic definitions in geometry. The first definition is that of a point. You can define a point like this. A point is that which has no part. In simple words, a point is the smallest and the most fundamental aspect of geometry. It has no size, length or depth. It's shown by a dot. Everything we will learn from now on will be based on a point. So let's do one thing. Let's place similar points closely one after the other. We see that it appears as a line. So a line is basically a closely spaced collection of points one after the other. You can define a line like this. A line is a breathless length. As we can see that the line has length but not breadth. Since a line is just a closely spaced collection of points, we can see here that the ends of a line are also points. You can define Mum, we are not able to hear now. Yes, now it's not heard. Now it's heard, Mum. line is a line. That lies yes, ma'am. Now it points on itself. We can understand this by taking a look at our line. Here, we observe that the arrangement or the alignment of points before this point is similar to the arrangement of points after this point. This pattern can be observed uniformly throughout our line. Thus, by Euclid's definition, it's a straight line. Now. Let's place a series of similar lines besides our line. When we do that, we see that the resultant pattern covers an area and has a length as well as a breadth. This is the geometric definition for a surface. Euclid defines surface in the following way. A surface is that which has length and breadth only. If we look closely at the edges of the surface, we will find that the boundaries of the surface are nothing but lines. So we can say that the edges of a surface are lines. Now let's look at the surface from the side view angle such that only the edge of the surface is visible to us. When we do that, the surface appears to us like a line. By Euclid's definition of a straight line, if the points on a line are evenly spaced, then it will be a straight line which means the edge is a straight line and the surface will look flat like this. Such surfaces where the straight lines are evenly placed are called plane surfaces. Euclid defines a plane surface like this. A plane surface is a surface which lies evenly with the straight lines on itself. Some examples of planar surfaces are a blackboard, a tabletop, Ma'am, Shreyas is not able to join. If you look at all the seven definitions, you will know. A put is that these are the basic definitions. So these are the basic the definitions we have learned, children. <laughs> Yet, these terms are defined using terms like breadth, length, part, etc. Which have to be explained as well. And to explain Mom. terms like breadth and length, we will yes. have to use some more fun. Shreyas is not able to join it seems ma'am. I just unlocked the meeting here. He can come back. Okay. These are the points we have learned in a previous class. Okay. Terms. A point Straight is a which has no part. Goes on and on. But it's important to note that these definitions are more intuitive than explanatory. That means even without the proper terminology, 
it's possible to understand them. These seven definitions form the base of modern geometry. So these are the definitions already we have learned, children. A point is that which has no part. These are the definitions is there in the introduction to Euclid geometry, chapter five. A line is a breadth. A line is breadth less length. The ends of a line are also points. A point is that which has no point. A line is a breadthless length. A end as ends of a line are points. A straight line is a line which lies evenly with the points on itself. A surface is that which has length and breadth only. The edges of a surface are lines. A plane surface is a surface which lies evenly with the straight lines on itself. These are the definitions with the examples they have showed. We will be able to use all of these in our further lessons to understand complex geometry. Now I'm going to explain the meaning of axioms. Axioms and postulates, children. Ready, children? Are you enjoying? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes ma'am. Yes, ma yes, ma After explaining definitions from his book, Elements, Euclid went on to explain some axioms that would help in understanding geometry better. What are axioms, you may ask? The general meaning of an axiom is a statement that is universally true and needs no proof. For example, we all know that most humans have one brain. We just know it's true and must be accepted. Similarly, Euclid assumed that some properties were true and did not have to be proved. He called these truths as axioms. These axioms are not restricted to geometry and can be applicable throughout mathematics. They will help us to prove and understand complex geometry in the upcoming lessons. In this lesson, we will study some of his axioms. The first axiom is, things which are equal to the same thing are equal to one another. What does this mean? Let's understand an example. Suppose Bob and Rob go to a store and both of them have These axioms are not restricted to geometry and can be applicable throughout mathematics. They will help us to prove and understand complex geometry in the upcoming lessons. In this lesson, we will study some of his axioms. The first axiom is, things which are equal to the same thing are equal to one another. What does this mean? Let's understand an example. Suppose Bob and Rob go to a store and both of them have five rupees. Bob buys a pen for five rupees and for the same price, Rob buys two candies. This means that the cost of one pen is equal to the cost of two candies. So if later Rob wants to trade his candies for Bob's pen, he would have to give two candies to Bob. This means the value of one pen is equal to the value of two candies. In mathematical sense, if a quantity A is equal to B and B is equal to C, then A is equal to C. The second axiom states that if equals are added to equals, then wholes are equal. To understand this axiom in a simpler way, Imagine if for 5 rupees you get 2 candies and for 7 rupees you get 1 pen. So if you add them together, you will see that for a total of 12 rupees you will get 2 candies and 1 pen. In the mathematical sense, let's say a quantity A is equal to C and quantity B is equal to D. Then A plus B will be equal to C plus D. The third axiom says that if equals are subtracted from equals, then the remainders are equal. Similar to the second axiom, if a quantity A is equal to C and quantity B is equal to D, then A minus B will be equal to C minus D. 
we will explain the remaining four axioms in the next part of the video. So children, what do you mean by axioms? Ma'am, universal truth. Teach do not I need any proof. proof. The assumptions which are obvious universal truth, they are not proved. So here we discussed first three axioms. Things which are equal to the same things are equal to one another. One another. Second yes. axiom, if equals are added to equals, the holes are equal. Third axiom, if equals are separated from equals, the remainders are equal. equal. Have you understood the meaning of these def uh, axioms, children? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Do anyone have yes, any doubt in the axioms? Yes, ma'am. Overall, oh, ma there are seven axioms are there. So just now we explained first three axioms. Now I'm going to explain four, fifth, sixth, and seventh. Enjoy the video, children. Move your devices and enjoy. Thank you. Ma'am, it's not hurt. Yes, yes. One minute, children. Six and are called axioms. So let us see few more axioms. If we put this blue triangle over this yellow triangle, then they will coincide. Means they are same in all aspects. So these two triangles have the same area, same perimeter. Same angles, same side lengths, etc. Things which coincide with one another are equal to one another. At times, you must have put one tile over another tile just to see whether they are same or not. So, the axiom seems to say that if two things are identical, that is, they are the same, then they are we know that 3 fourths is less than 1 because we divided an object into 4 equal parts and took only 3 parts. That is 3 out of 4. Same way 15 by 16 is less than 1 because the whole is greater. than the part and it's the another axiom. Even 62 by 63 is less than 1 that represents the whole object because a tiny fraction is missing from 1 to make it 62 by 63. Thus, whole is always greater than the part. That's why we say proper fraction is always less than 1. Now, here we see water in the left hand side glass is twice or double the amount of water in the right hand side glass. Also, the water in the bowl is also twice or double the amount of water in the right hand side glass. This means the amount of the water in both the glass and the bowl is same as both are double the amount of water in the half-filled glass. And this is what Euclid's axiom says. Things which are double of the same things are equal to one another. Let's cut a watermelon into two halves. What can you say? Well, the two halves are equal to one another. And this is Euclid's another axiom which says things which are halves of the same things are equal to one another. That's all for now. We will continue with Euclid's postulates in the next lesson. Until then, bye-bye. Hello everyone. 
Now we know few assumptions could be used throughout mathematics. Okay, children. So now here I will explain the next four axioms. The fourth one is things which coincide with one another are equal to one another. The whole is greater than the part. Things which are double of the same things are equal to one another. Things which are halves of the same things are equal to one another. Do anyone have any doubt in the explanation of this axioms, children? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. So with this example, it's easy to understand. No, ma'am. Right? Yes, yes. If there's no doubt, means I'll move on to the postulates. Shall we move on to postulates, children? Yes, ma'am. Okay. We will guys this. We'll move on to postulates. Can you construct an equilateral triangle from a line segment AB? Think about how you can do it. To construct the equilateral triangle, we have to find the third vertex other than A and B. For that, let's take a compass. We put the fixed point of compass on one of the points, say B. Now taking this line segment AB as the radius, we draw a circle with B as its center. Similarly, without changing the length of the compass, repeat the process by placing its fixed point on point A. Now we see that we have two circles with centers A and B. And both these circles intersect at these two points. So if we join points A and B to this point, we see that they are nothing but the radii of the circles. And since the radii of both the circles are equal to each other, and also equal to the length of side AB, we get an equilateral triangle here. We will get an equilateral triangle even if we join points A and B to this point here. Wasn't it interesting? Such knowledge of geometry was known to people from ancient times. Around 300 BCE, the Greek mathematician Euclid combined all the knowledge of geometry known at that time in a set of 13 books called Elements. One interesting thing Euclid did was that he set out to prove that the geometrical relations known at that time follows logically from some simple things we know intuitively to be true. Euclid showed that the knowledge of geometry can be proven by just assuming some things to be true. These five true statements form the base of all modern geometry. He called these true statements or facts as postulates. You'd be wondering what the difference between axioms and postulates is. Well, in geometry, they are essentially interchangeable. The general meaning of postulate is a true statement. But in the case of Euclid, a postulate is a true statement, or rather a fact, that's applicable in geometry only. So in this lesson, let's take a look at the five important postulates that Euclid devised, which helped him prove more theorems. Let's have a look at what the first postulate says. It states that a straight line may be drawn from any one point to any other point. Yes. To understand this, suppose we have two points A and B separated by a distance. Now, if we want to join them, we see that we can draw only one straight line that will connect the both of them. We can take the help of Euclid's axiom that states Given two distinct points, there is a unique line passing through them. So a line from A joining B is AB. Similarly, the line joining A from B is also AB. The second postulate states that a terminated line can be produced indefinitely. By terminated line, we understand that it's a line segment. This postulate means that if we have a line segment AB, we can extend both its ends endlessly. What about the next postulate? The third postulate says that a circle can be drawn with any center at any 
obedience. This postulate is self-explanatory, but for our understanding, let's assume a line segment AB. Keep point A fixed and move point B around point A. We will see that it will make a circle and the length of the line segment AB will be the radius of the circle. Likewise, we can draw a circle from any point and with any radius. The fourth postulate says that all right angles are equal to one another. Look at the square and a rectangle. We see that all the interior angles of the rectangle and the square are right angles. Therefore, an angle from a square will be equal to an angle from a rectangle. So, these are the Euclid's first four postulates that will help us having a better understanding of geometry. In the next lesson, we will study about Euclid's fifth postulate and move ahead. Children, any doubt in the postulates, children? Do you want to repeat all the five postulates again? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Is it interesting? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. New topic. Yes, ma'am. Yes, new topic. Euclid geometry. Construct an equilateral triangle from a line segment AB. So I'll start showing from the postcards, children. A and B. Make a compass on one of the points. A circle with B at its center of the compass. Both these circles. Okay, I'll start from first postulate. Since the radii of B get an equilateral triangle here. We will get an equilateral triangle even if we join points A and B to this point here. Wasn't it interesting? Such knowledge of geometry was known to people from ancient times. Around 300 BCE, the Greek mathematician Euclid combined all the knowledge of geometry known at that time in a set of 13 books called Elements. One interesting thing Euclid did was that he set out to prove that the geometrical relations known at that time follows logically from some simple things we know intuitively to be true. Euclid showed that the knowledge of geometry can be proven by just assuming some things to be true. These five true statements form the base of all modern geometry. He called these true statements or facts as postulates. You'd be wondering what the difference between axioms and postulates is. Well, in geometry, they are essentially interchangeable. The general meaning of postulate is a true statement. But in the case of Euclid, a postulate is a true statement, or rather a fact, that's applicable in geometry only. So in this lesson, let's take a look at the five important postulates that Euclid devised, which helped him prove more theorems. Let's have a look at what the first postulate says. It states that a straight line may be drawn from any one point to any other point. To understand this, suppose we have two points A and B separated by a distance. Now, if we want to join them, we see that we can draw only one straight line that will connect the both of them. We can take the help of Euclid's axiom that states, given two distinct points, there is a unique line passing through them. So, a line from A joining B is AB. Similarly, the line joining A from B is also AB. The second postulate states that a terminated line can be produced indefinitely. By terminated line, we understand that it's a line segment. This postulate means that if we have a line segment AB, we can extend both its ends endlessly. What about the next postulate? The third postulate says that a circle can be drawn with any center and any radius. This postulate is self-explanatory, but for our understanding, let's assume a line segment AB. Keep point A fixed and move point B around point A. We will see that it will make a circle and the length of the 
line segment EB will be the radius of the circle. Likewise, we can draw a circle from any point and with any radius. The fourth postulate says that all right angles are equal to one another. Look at the square and a rectangle. We see that all the interior angles of the rectangle and the square are right angles. Therefore, an angle from a square will be equal to an angle from a rectangle. So, these are the Euclid's first four postulates that will help us having a better understanding of geometry. In the next lesson, we will study about Euclid's... So, shall we repeat all the first four postulates? There are five postulates are there. Postulates are applicable only for geometry children, but axioms are applying everywhere in the mathematics. Okay. So first postulate, a straight line may be drawn from any one point to any other point. Second postulate, a terminated line can be produced indefinitely. A circle can be drawn with any center and any radius. All right angles are equal to one another. I hope these first four postulates are clear to everyone. Children, yes, axioms yes, seven are there. Postulates five are there. So these are the first four postulates. Fifth postulates I'm going to show you the next slide. So to hello everyone. If one line intersects two other lines, yes, ma'am, an axiom and postulate are both the same things, no, ma'am. So both are same, but axioms we are applying all over the mathematics, but postulates only for geometry. No, beta. Yes, the sir. previous slide I have explained to me a difference of axioms and postulates. Hello everyone. If one line intersects two other lines, then this is a fifth the postulate. Whether these two lines are parallel or not, it's easy. For such cases, Euclid said in his fifth postulate, if sum of two interior angles is less than two right angle on a side then two lines would eventually meet on that side so the two lines here are ab and cd and they are intersected by the third line and we need to find if they are parallel or not here if you see angle aef and angle efc are interior angles on the left side of the intersecting line, angle AEF plus angle EFC is less than 180 degree. So AB and CD would eventually meet if we extend them on this side, that is on left hand side. But the lines would not meet on the other side if extended. On the other side, that is on the right side of the intersecting line. Angle BEF plus angle EFD is greater than 180 degree. Look carefully. AB and CD would move further if we extend them on the right hand side. This means the lines will meet on the side where the sum of interior angles is less than 180 degree. And that's why Euclid said if a straight line Falling on two straight lines makes interior angles on the same side of it, which taken together is less than two right angles. Then the two straight lines, if produced indefinitely, meet on that side. That's all for now. Bye bye. So, Alice Children, fifth postulates. The straight yes, line falling on two straight lines makes the interior angles on the same side of it taken together less than two right angles. The, they have shown to us left side. It is less than 180 degree because we know that interior angles are supplementary. So, but towards left side, it is less than 180 degree. Then two straight lines, if produced indefinitely, meet on the side on which the sum of angles less than two right angles. So, I hope this... Fifth postulates are clear. Children, axioms, postulates in exam, we, we, we are asking only to write postulates. But in axioms, based on axioms, we are going to solve some sums, children. So that exercise sums, I'm going to explain the next class. 